have you have you got a new camera no no i've got the um, that car lamp yeah set up again but this time without uh, <laughs> without glue that melts <laughs> 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 okay, so let's try this. Hello, Mike. That's it. How are you today? That's exactly what's happening. Great, good. Okay, fantastic. <laughs> Hi, I'm Mike Brampton. And I'm Julian Hood. Welcome to episode three of Veterinary Ramblings. Except it's episode four, isn't it, Mike? Five, four, three, two. Hi, I'm Mike Brampton. And my name is Julian Ho. Welcome to Veterinary Ramblings. So we've we've got a special guest tonight, Julian. Yeah, who we've got tonight? Uh, he's got a super, super guy. Um, hmm. I didn't realise that he was involved in quite as much as he actually is. Um, yeah. He's... he's uh, He's known to a lot of people in the veterinary industry, and, and some people say that he is the frog whisperer. I think I know him. You I think I know him, yeah. Well yeah. The frog whisperer. Some mm -hmm. say if there's a snake in, snake in the room, he's got it handled. There's a lot of work with, with exotic birds and all sorts of stuff, but what you probably don't know is he's also a very well-known author. Let, yeah. Let's get Matt Rendell in. Matt, good evening. Good evening. How are you? Hi, Matt. How are you? Yeah, I'm good, thanks. How are you okay? Excellent, yes. Well, as, as well as we, we could be. Um, I'm, well I'm really excited, Matt. Sorry, Julian? As well as could be expected, thank you. Um, Except, yeah. look, let's get the drink counter going here. So this is this is a Negroni, yeah. And Negroni has uh, two shots of Thanks. of gin. This is Plymouth gin. Other gins are available. You've uh, you've got through most of that bottle, mate. You showed that as a new bottle last week. No. Yes, you did. I use it to cook. Right. Okay. Right. Well, yeah, I did a bit of drinking while I was cooking. Yeah. Uh, gin and prawns. Got martini, uh, gin and prawns. Now there's a nice one, isn't it? Mm. That's a Greek Greek dish. Yeah. Uh, bit of martini. Double shot of martini. Uh, and some Campari. So it's, it's and a double two shot of Campari. One martini, one Campari. So uh, I think well, Campari is twenty five percent, and uh, martini is probably very little. That's only fifteen percent. There you go. Fifteen percent. Yeah, yeah. And, and your Plymouth gin is sixty percent overproof navy. Sixty percent. So um, I I raise you your gin and tonic to my four possibly five drinks already. <laughs> Get that count again. And Matt's got orange squash, squash. <laughs> yeah. which is which is great. And actually, we're going to wish tomorrow morning that we'd had that orange squash instead, aren't we? Quite probably. <clears throat> Have you have you covered up your chairs by the way? Is that a sort of are you decorating this your room? Chair? Oh yeah. it's because I'm in the cat's bedroom. Oh I see, right. It's, that's not a euphemism for something. I'm genuinely in our in the bedroom the kitten sleep the kitten sleeps in. So she pretty much destroys everything. So Good. I thought it was some sort of Mrs. Fathersham type of uh, scenario or all the all the If that's how you want to imagine me, that's absolutely fine, Julian, you know. No. I'm really excited to, to welcome you tonight, Matt, because um, what you probably won't know is that when I used to race bicycles, um, I used to race for a trade team called Blazing Saddles. And of course, Blazing Saddles is the title of one of your top selling books. Um, and it's all about the, un the unusual. I'll, sh I'll show you if you like. It's, it's all here. Um, here we go. Blazing Saddles, the cruel and unusual history of the Tour de France. And I, I'm just yeah. thinking, what a crazy coincidence that is. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, Mike. Yeah. I, 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 don't, I don't think that's how Matt spells his surname. Sadly not, no. 
and, and I'm fairly sure Matt hasn't done the Tour de France. Am I right there, Matt? I'm not being disparaging. Yeah, that's, a, that's a fair assumption, Julian, I think. Yeah, I've not done the Tour de France. I've been I to France. Kind of place place but, but yeah, yeah, not me. Yeah. Oh, you, you, you fucked up, haven't you, Mike? Oh. Was that was that a Google search? Yeah. Did, did you did you put the whole of Matt's name in uh, RVN as well, RVN. Or, or just no, no, and and it all came up, and I got all excited, and, yeah. and yeah. obviously you you know that I've I've been racing bicycles for years, and so bicycles and a, a little bit like. Graham, when, when Graham came up and, and he'd written about all of the great climbs in the Tour de France and, and riding a bicycle and everything, and I, I just got excited. I, I think you're getting fixated on the Tour de France connection there, Mike. Um, oh. it, it's very unlikely, isn't it, that, that anyone we invite from the veterinary field will also be major eventers in the Tour de France, isn't it? I know there were one or two, one or two. But not the one or two we've had. Okay, then, as you say. I, th I think I do own a yellow jersey somewhere, but that's as close as I get. I think so. Well, that's good. That's good. That'll that'll help Mike. Um, I'm sure get over his um, pathetic error. Good. C. Shepherd, is it? Yeah. Ah, excellent. Do you, do you want to tell us a bit about that? Uh, that tea, C. Shepherd. Um, while, while you're getting another drink, um, I, I better explain to people who aren't necessarily able to to watch this that uh, Mike is wearing a, a jolly nice long sleeve T-shirt that says C. Shepherds on it. Uh, I have absolutely no idea what the relevance uh, for that is, but because it was clearly new and he's proud of it and he's just made a terrific boob about Matt's name, uh, I thought I'd better try and redeem him by uh, bringing his T-shirt into into context. Excellent. Well, it, it was actually Oceans um, Oceans Day or, or Protection of the Oceans Day this week. Um, oh. but let me break off just for a moment because yeah. I'm going to mix myself up a nice gin and tonic. A right. Shetland Reel. I seem to have a thing for these. Shetland stuff. Reel? There is. Yeah. So I'm going Very to nice. gins are available. Um, I will share that with you um, now. Great. Pre-recorded that, Matt, so don't worry about it. Right. <laughs> <laughs> How many of these have you done? Uh, eh? <laughs> We've done a few. We've done a few. <laughs> okay. Is it seamless? It's all seamless. Right. Okay. Great. So tonight, I'm going to prepare you a special one, which is the Shetland Reel. Now, I'm particularly into uh, ocean stuff, as you can probably tell by the T-shirt that I'm wearing. So a nice Shetland Reel from another Scottish distillery. Seem to have a thing about Scottish distilleries, don't you think? So, first off, in goes the ice. Secondly, you'll have noticed already that I do like to zest the fruit that I use. The smell of a drink as I rub this around the rim is half the experience of the flavour. I'm just going to cut the edge off here because this makes it easier just to put that dribble of lime into the top. Now for the Shetland Reel. This is also a very good one with sea kelp but I haven't got any sea kelp with me so I'm going to keep it simple with the lime. Nice measure of gin there and in that goes. Sticking with my favourites, fever tree. My special mixer, <laughs> I'll throw at you. <laughs> my special mixer here. So just pour this down. This aerates the tonic as it dribbles down there and mixes into the gin. There we go. Just aerates that out. So, Shetland Reel. They're good for several. They do different flavours. But this is one of my particular favourites. 
the Shetland Reel Ocean. Good, simple flavours. Very, very nice. Cheers. So, so Matt, having having discovered now that you're not uh, a, a leader in the Tour de France authorship uh, series, um, you, you are actually rather more better than that, aren't you, if I may use the term so ungrammatically correctly. You're better than anyone in the Tour de France because you are one of the leading veterinary nurses for exotic species in England, if not the world. Is that right? I don't, know, I don't know about the world, but yeah, I'm, I'm reasonably experienced with exotic species and I've worked in lots of different places with wild species as well. So yeah, I've done, done my time. So even tapirs, yeah. Even so, tapirs. Yeah, three species, but, but yeah, very nice. Tapirs, very good for the heart. There's a tribe in, uh, in Borneo that eat primarily tapir meat and they have the lowest incidence of cardiac disease in the world. My friend did his PhD on resource partitioning in Colombia, and he says he? to this day, smoked, Colum smoked tapir was the tastiest thing he's ever eaten. So Is, it, is that right? Yeah, it's supposed to be very tasty. But, but being perfect. in Colombia, he probably drunk guys, something. Guys, 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 yeah. guys, 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 I'm sorry, I'm sorry to interrupt on this one, but is this is really in yeah. eating the animals. <laughs> yeah. I, not, I, not good. I, I, I readily appreciate that we eat animal flesh, and as you know, I'm fairly into a, a sort of a keto style of diet, which almost excludes vegetables and, and carbohydrates. But um, can, can, I, can I stop you there, Mike? Sorry, my, my pangolin's burning. I, I'll take it off the stove. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, Matt. Sorry about that. Sorry about that. <laughs> <coughs> We've we yeah, just killed that. I'm going to make a gin. <laughs> <laughs> Look at that. You're impressed, aren't you? The nose is a bit long. Because it, it was fine, but, but it sort of stretched as it, as it dropped. And in the end, I had, to get a, I had to get a pencil under it, just like that, to stop it drooping right. anymore. That's, that's definitely the best homemade tapir I've ever seen, I, I have to Great, say. So there's... I couldn't do the legs, so I had to have him lying down. Right. But but there's, look, really, very little difference, isn't there? They're, they're almost identical, actually, Julian, but what concerns me is that a person known for his orthopaedics couldn't do legs. <laughs> <laughs> What's that all about? <laughs> legs are tricky old things, Mike. Yeah. But, and, they're mushy. You can't do a thing with them. <laughs> Why off feed it in slugs has never really taken off. Fair enough. You were determined to get tapers in early, weren't you? I wanted to get tapers in. Yeah, they're my favourite odd-toed ungulate. So, so what's the what's the link, Matt? I mean, what's do you you were saying that your friend's PhD is in in tapirs. He did, he, uh, he did uh, resource own. partitioning, I think. Sorry, resource, yeah, resource partitioning in reptiles in Colombia. Right. So he spent four or five years living in Colombia doing his PhD. Right. And mostly chilies and rice is basically what, what your diet consists of and fish. And I think the fish gets a bit samey quite quickly. So um, the tribe that he was living next to, uh, he helped out on a few occasions and they would bring him the odd bit of um, tapir every now and again as a as a treat, which he said he kind of reframed from for a brief period of time, and then found out it's actually delicious. Um, but yeah, I can't, I can't say that. I, <laughs> I, it just, it always makes me smile because um, people often ask him about his cuisine, and um, he often refers to that being the favourite thing he's ever eaten. He's eaten lots of strange stuff, but yeah. <laughs> have you ever met a tapir, Julian? I have, I have. I've met many a tapir. I would, honestly, I would love a tapir for my birthday. It's in August. Uh, right. There's, a, there's a, a wildlife park uh, just outside Somerset that have some uh, some tapirs, uh, Brazilian, not not uh, not Malayan. And uh, there's one very very friendly one that comes along and you can stroke its back. They're very friendly. Yeah, they can. They can give a nasty bite though, can't they? 
the, the the indicus, the Malayan ones, yeah, they can break your fingers, but the the Brazilian ones don't tend to be. They're much calmer, but they're yeah. amazing animals. Did they let you scratch it down? Did they let you scratch it? Yeah. Like, so they fall yeah. over, and scratch them. They're, they're bizarre. I, it, it did. It did. I, th I thought I pushed it or, or, or done something. I thought it would have fainted, but suddenly it's rolled over. And they said, you've got to tickle its tummy now. Yeah. I, I, and, I taught one to, to do it and to the point that we could x-ray its legs and blood sample it and do all sorts of stuff. It's a very deep, really? once they go into that deep, overwhelming happiness and they're, they're pretty safe for a long period of time. Amazing yeah. animals. That's, that's, that's not like trancing it, is it? Or is it? No. No, it's a pleasurable experience because they lay down by themselves. Right. So Trump is a fear response rather than that. So, Tapius have no gallbladder, Julian. Did you know that? Lewis. I didn't know that. No, they have no gallbladder. Yeah, they have no gallbladder. Oh. Anyway, that's a good pub quiz question for you. Yes. Just had a, yeah. So is this it? Is this us doing it? Because it's going ever so well, I feel. It's going all right. This is. It never gets deeper than this, really. This is it. Is it? Every every now and then, uh, one of us will do a, a quote from from an old um, Pete and Dud, uh, you know Peter Cook and Dudley Moore, and they used to do this this sketch with um, with Dudley Moore as the uh, as as the interrogator, and uh, as Peter Cook as usually Sir Arthur Grebe Streebling or Sir Arthur Streebling. <laughs> they, uh, I, I spent I spent the last thirty years of my life attempting unsuccessfully to teach ravens to fly underwater. And just saying, teaching ravens to fly underwater will instantly segue into a... Any interesting stories about ravens, Matt? <laughs> See how it works. It's crazy, isn't it? Seamless stuff. <laughs> it is quite seamless. So, um, funny you should say that, Julian, but yeah, I, I've had the um, fortune or misfortune in some respects to treat a raven um, that belongs to the Queen. So the Queen obviously has her ravens at the Tower of London. I think um, I think Mike and I had quite a stressful morning with one of the ravens from the Tower of London. Oh, I, um, I remember that, man. What, what happened was that um, we'd, we'd got to look at, we were sort of doing an annual MOT on, on the, the Queen's ravens, the ravens from the Tower of London. Hmm. Hmm. And um, I'd just, uh, I'd produced um, a cloacal pulse oximeter sensor. And the, the concept was that we were going to be able to knock these ravens down and monitor them to very high levels. And everything was going to be absolutely fine. And what we were unaware of, is, is it the, was it the Raven Master or something, Matt? The Raven Master, yeah. So he's the, the head yeoman that his whole job is just looking after the ravens. So the, and they're normally people who've held a really high position in the army, aren't they? Yeah, so they're normally people that have um, either been in special forces or something along those lines, um, who then, for whatever reason, get to the point that they can no longer do their um, full job. So then they get invited to become a yeoman of the Tower of London. It's an amazing thing, amazing um, um, opportunity for them and they live on site in the Tower of London so they have these little houses that are built into the tower uh, hmm. and they live and um, yeah amazing um, they're incredible people it's, it's, yeah it's, it's great amazing. it's great fun I mean but one of the intriguing things I find is that the the, the, the Raven Master this new Raven Master he'd had his instructions the night before or several days before with what we had to do with, with the ravens and, and what he was supposed to do. And bless him, he, he, he rocked up with, I can't remember how many there were. And um, we, well, I can't remember, we knocked the damn thing out, didn't we? And oh, we got, we got a yeah. raven in the background there, Julian. You need to I've, got a, I've got a small raven I stole from the tower a few years back. It was either that or the crown jewels, couldn't decide which to get. And the yeah, fair enough. It's, it's either a black cat or, it, or it's a raven. But anyway, so we, we, we induced anaesthesia on the first one and uh, went to intubate said patient, which immediately vomited. So all, all hands went to decks to try and clear the whole airway, protect the airway and, and the works on this vomiting raven. And 
this this hardcore special forces guy had felt sorry that they weren't going to get their breakfast, so he'd fed them just before he brought them in. <laughs> yeah, rookie uh, error. Well, oh, you know, no. whatever. <laughs> I, I, I suppose the, the punchline to that, the punchline to all of that was, was I got home. We, we had a pretty stressful morning that morning, didn't we? Hmm. But we we saved, yeah. the, saved the bird and obviously cancelled all the rest of them that had come in. But uh, I got home and I was asked, so the ravens from the Tower of London, how exciting is this? Did you get the pictures? Did you get the video? Did the new pulse oximeter sensor work? Uh, actually, we were too busy doing. What? You didn't get any pictures? <laughs> we, never, we never did get the pictures, did we, Matt? No. <laughs> we well, never many, got the pictures, but uh, oh well, that's life. That's life. How many ravens does the does the Queen have? How many are there at the Tower? Uh, from Normally, they have about eight. So, and they're all rescues. So they all come from rescue centres from the north of England, normally. So yeah, and they're not they're not winglets or anything. They can fly, but they just are trained to stand around in the grounds, and they have their own particular areas they stand up. So, That's interesting. Yeah, so with, with sheep, it's called hefted, isn't it? When they're bonded to a particular area, is, is that the same term for for? I don't know what it would be called. They just and they're very specific. So when he opens the cages, they'll go and stand in their particular area. Um, yeah. And that's where they, yeah, spend that hang out away from the tourists as much as possible. So I naively assumed that they were bred there, or, or they had a you know, couple of hundred of them. So yeah, no, they just have, and they tend to. Um, they're very. Some of the birds are very old there. They're in their tw late twenties, and the, um, they tend to have contacts with people where injured ravens come in and get rehabilitated, and they end up at the tower. So when does that start? That tradition. Um, it depends who you talk to. So if you read historians' guidelines, it was very much early 18th century. Um, but if you talk to the people that are actually, no, they think it was pretty much made up in the 19th century. Um, mm. The origins of it when, because um, the Tower of London was the first zoological type collection in the UK and they had polar bears and all sorts of random stuff mm. in the days where you could, they would die and you would just get more. And um, I think it's a kind of, nods to the fact that it was at one point an animal collection and they kept the ravens so, right yeah right. that that's the, the kind of history behind it because they, they found rhino skeletons and things there haven't they and uh, everything yeah so they, they they had lots of um it was in a very different era where they would just have lots and lots of species that would get collected and be gifted often mm. to the royal family and then they were kept in cages in their very small cages um, and probably didn't live very long, but it didn't really matter at that point. They didn't have a perception of conservation or endangerment or anything, so they would just ship in a few more. So, yeah, it's bizarre, really, when you think about it. Outside. Really, really bizarre. I, I like to think that we've made some progress, at least. In the yeah, meaning. I think we're, we're more aware, certainly. Although, I mean, getting back, um, if I made it to, to tapirs or, or tapirs, I believe they pronounced that way as well, um, I would, I would love a tapir. I'd love a breeding pair of tapirs in the garden. Okay, maybe a bigger garden. I'd love to, but, but I would ne never get them. I'd never get them because it would be unfair to do that. And yet people do keep all sorts of ridiculous animals, don't they? They have no idea how to look after them. And I guess as, a, as an exotic nurse, a lot of your job must be dealing with the consequences of poor husbandry with those animals. Yeah, there's lots of people that buy things on a whim um, and sometimes with no perception of how long they live for or how big they're going to get or um, the challenges of keeping that animal healthy. And that is down to people just not not spending the time to research them. Um, and sometimes I find that very challenging. So some species are incredibly intelligent and are struggling. So parrots particularly, people mm. that buy macaws that... Um, don't really realise that they're going to live to 50, 60 years and be incredibly demanding for their whole life and destroy everything that they get hold of. Um, yeah. And they keep them so solitary. Um, and I was lucky enough to work in Peru for a short period of time and having seen flocks of macaws where... Um, Hundreds of them in together. Incredible, yeah. Uh, yeah. With the guide laughing at me because I saw like three macaws one day and was kind of leaping about with excitement and then he was like kind of you're an idiot 
And then the next day we saw a flock of about 700 um, to the point that your neck was hurting from looking up and seeing them. And you just think it's just incredible. Um, and to keep something like that in, in, in kind of not in contact with its own kind is incredibly hard. Um, and hence, and then they're surprised when they start pulling their feathers out or um, having malnourishment and yeah, it's really yeah. sad. Yeah, it is. And I guess the problem is that they are relatively easy to get hold of, aren't they? You, you just need to rock up with your money and uh, you take one home with you. Yeah, I think um, there's there's the controls around what you can and can't buy um, within Europe and, and the UK is very strange. Uh, even from dangerous animals, some of the things that I think are potentially dangerous and not covered by any licensing, whereas other things that are not particularly dangerous are. Um, so it, it's a very complicated subject because it is down to the people that own these things to to try and look after them properly and work with them safely. But uh, the, the rules are very, very odd. So mm. you can buy a species of um, giant centipede that could land you in hospital with one bite. A uh, giant centipede, they're about this big and scary. Yeah, um, Scolopendra gigantica is the really dangerous one. And that would bite you to the point that you were you would end up in so much pain you'd be in hospital. But that's not covered under the Dangerous Wild Animals Act at all. Really? No, no, I'm... Oh, bollocks. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> so... <laughs> so uh, Mike, of course, would never have uh, sexual relations with a duck or any other member of the Waterfell family. Uh, for the sake of those listeners who are just now turning on and uh, listening to our recording, swans, perhaps swans uh, on a, on a good night, uh, perhaps a, a boat uh, race night. Uh, if they're the nice mute swan, you might go for it, but generally not. Generally, that's the thing. Not, not definitely not. I would say welcome back, but that would tell uh, people watching that we'd actually cocked up and uh, lost our, uh, our our Zoom meeting. So. Uh, uh, we'll pretend that we've uh, just finished the anecdote we've gone on seamlessly, which works better. Yeah. However, had we actually stopped for a while, I probably would have noticed that I actually just look like a, a pineapple because I've only got my head in this, this top part here. Uh, you, you could have given me some sort of signal. There's a chat thing just on the top corner there of the, uh, uh, the Zoom thing. You could have said, look, fuck's sake, Julian, all you can see is your head. So anyway, what I'm going to do is I'm going to move this back now. There we go. You can see Wait. my lovely... Because yeah, we are we are professionals, not comedians. We're certainly not comedians. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know about the professional bit, to be honest. There are professions and there are professions. And right now we're looking like a bunch of the oldest professionals. Uh, cheers. <laughs> cheers. <laughs> cheers. Okay. You, you'll drop your glass, it'll break. No, no. Well, it might do. It might do. I don't know. It's hard to say. No, gla glasses break. Very breakable things, glasses, aren't they, Matt? Mine's an unbreakable glass. I've got one of these very thick glasses. Well, you, drop it, really. Go on. Drop you, it. And we'll you're see. drinking out of a plastic glass, Matt. Is that what you're yeah, saying? Plastic, just very thick, like me. But um, yeah, unbreakable, like me. Talk, talking of unbreakable, other things are unbreakable. Normally, are uh, are tortoises, aren't they? Yeah, you know, the, the the plastron. Very, very, very that, tough. That's the, that's the carapace. The carapace. The plaster on the bottom, isn't it? As a carapace, yeah. yeah. Anyway, so, but we had we had a tortoise brought into practice a few years ago with uh, with a nasty, nasty crack on the on the carapace. Uh, and unfortunately, the, the owner told us uh, a story about how it had got this crack that, that was so horrific that, that you had to sort of stop your your nervous laughter. So this, this, this poor... This poor tortoise, 35 year old spur thigh tortoise, had been having a little munch on some dandelions in the owner's garden. And the owner's father came to visit, driving a, a rusty old Morris Minor, and he, he popped up on the, on the drive. Uh, quite a steep drive, and he didn't trust the brakes. So he, um, he reached out a, a hand and, and grabbed this rock from the garden and shoved it behind his, his wheel, uh, spent a nice weekend with his daughter and when he left he, he took the rock away from the back and put it back on the lawn where it carried on eating its its dandelions and unfortunately the poor thing had developed this really nasty crack through having a I don't know three-quarter ton Morris Minor on its back for three days uh, and we 
I repaired it with, with fiberglass, which at the time was, was you know, the, the thing to use. Is it still the best thing to use, Matt? Or? Um, we tend not to use fiberglass anymore. Um, they just, it tends to um, just hold everything together, but it doesn't tend to allow the shell to heal. So we tend to treat them as kind of open wounds now, kind of granulating and epithelializing wounds and, and treat them that way. And they do and well. What do, what, what do you use to cover the um, to cover the wound? Do you just use... Uh... Uh, depends what country I'm in. So uh, plastic bags are very good if you're in a country where you don't have dressing materials. But ideally you want something that is uh, occlusive so it kind of holds the water mm. away from the wound if it's an aquatic species or just holds bugs away um they can lose a lot of fluid through their shell injuries mm. so it's important to keep it um as sealed as you can because they're, they're really uh, quite intricate living structures aren't they the uh, the shells and tortoises yeah they hold a lot of blood supply and they have uh they have the ability to shunt blood through their shells to enable them to lose heat and also gain heat um, and there's loads of things we just don't know about it. So it, it, nobody is really sure whether uh, Chelonian shells can absorb UV light. Uh, you would think they probably should be able to, because obviously they, the, they're the majority of, of um, Chelonians is their shell, uh, but no one's really sure. Um, and when you see some species bask, they tend to put their heads and their legs completely stretched out, which would make you think that perhaps they can't. But um, And also when you see sea turtles that are covered in barnacles and plant life and all sorts of things that you'd think that that would really inhibit their ability to to uh, produce UV light and there's all sorts of hypotheses about whether they don't get all of that detritus on their shell until they're adults so by which time they've done most of their growth anyway and their calcium is already sorted but who knows we just don't know so much we don't know interesting I, I can tell you one thing on that I mean UV light I can't comment on um, but I can comment on infrared light and the, they seem to be able to absorb um, infrared light and block that transmission through the shell, uh, but not in, not in other areas. So I'm going to show you a, little, a quick little video here. Um, you'll notice, I'll play it again quickly, that you hear the whoosh, which is coming from the heart and the aorta. That's where we're picking mm -hmm. up the, the Doppler sound. Um, is then later picked up as that pulse wave travels out um, to the to the carotid artery is then picked up by the pulse oximeter so you'll hear the whoosh and then you hear the beep of the the pulse oximeter have, have a listen to this then we'll talk about the heart yeah. There's a lag, isn't there? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So have you ever seen, you've seen stuff like that, I think, Matt, haven't you? Yeah, I think that their, um, their blood pressure is very low most of the time and their ability to shunt and use their uh, renal portal system is very much better developed than we give it credit for. It, it's used as an excuse sometimes for why things won't go to sleep with gaseous anesthesia, but... Not sure that's always the case, but they 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 are much more um, well developed for for what they need to do than we give them credit for. Mm. So they would be able to cope with extremes that mammals would never be able to deal with. And I think um, I think sometimes when it comes to anaesthesia, they're they're a bit more of a challenge because they're um, you need to think about the whole animal and its physiological adaptations for what it does. Mm. Mm. Yeah, I think. I think certainly in, in that particular case that we were involved in there, um, one, one of the surprising things for us was, was listening to the difference in the heartbeat instead of the normal <laughs> noise from the Doppler. We got this sort of <laughs> sound. And uh, I, I found that quite fascinating because we, we glibly describe it as a three-chambered heart. Mm, yes. But, the reality, well, the, we, we describe it as the three-chambered heart, but the reality of that is, were it a true three-chambered heart, 
then you would get oxygenated and deoxygenated blood mixing. Yes. So yeah. you wouldn't actually see a circulatory saturation of anything near 99%. It would be. It would I was be just about to question that. It's 98% on that. So yeah, lo logically, it would be. Um, much lower wouldn't it yeah absolutely so so i think it, it's interesting to note there that we call it a three-chambered heart but there is actually still a central septum which whilst that the, the the main vessel isn't absolutely divided there's no muscular wall there there is actually a, a delineation between the two sides um so, so it's an early so development a four chambered heart so there's a physical separation. It's not just done by laminar flow. There's no uh, separation just due to uh, left and right laminar flow causing loss of mixing. As far as I'm aware, I, do you want to jump in here, Matt? <laughs> I, as far as I'm aware, there's there's a there's actual there's actually a separation there. Yeah, I, I think it depends on flow. the species. I think a, a lot of it depends on what they are. But I think it's a combination of things. Their myocardium is not like anything you've ever seen. They're just such it's such a flabby, thin, uh, adaptable thing. And their ability to shut off their pneumonic blood supply to enable them to cope with drowning or being underwater for any other reason or being restricted that they can breathe is, is amazing because their lungs are so, um, so kind of simple um, and gaseous exchange occurs without pressure. So it enables them to be able to be very efficient with their um, pneumonic exchange, which I think is why they're just, you know, their ability to survive diving and, and, and live in a completely aquatically is, um, is, is down to their circulation, but also the fact that they're, they're able to shunt their blood around very efficiently. And presumably the haemoglobin molecules are, are structurally different as well, are they? Yeah, they, um, they're, they're slightly different within them. They don't have, um, have a slightly different setup with their hemoglobin but they 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 can cope with very low levels of oxygen as it is um but they can also cope with um circulating and being very efficient when they get that amount of um low oxygen saturation still circulating but they can keep recirculating it and supplying the vital organs that they need to do and a lot of that is temperature dependent as well that's 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 actually very that's fascinating because to a certain extent, you're, you're crossing over two areas that I've been involved in in my career. Um, and I go back into the, the, the 1970s, which um, Julian will relate to. Yeah, I was born not far off then, absolutely. Come yeah. on. <laughs> okay, I'm going to wind the clock back on no, this. I'm a, I'm a serious child, it's all right. I was going to say you 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 grad. When did you when did you graduate with your first degree? Uh, Eighty five. Oh, you saw. <laughs> okay, so back in nineteen seventy nine, I don't think you were even thought of then, were you, Matt? No, I'd have been seven then. So. <laughs> bring, bring it on. <laughs> back in seventy nine, I was a lab technician. Um, whilst at, at college, working on a project to prove the concept that the colour of blood changed depending on the amount of oxygen being carried. And we were using a mass spectrophotometer at the time, and Ooh. the species we were working with were crabs. Now, as everybody listening will know, crab's blood is blue. But it's hemolymph rather than blood, isn't it? Uh, it's, it's... I believe it's... Uh, yeah. yeah. Sorry, is, is that right, Matt? Yeah, hemolymph, yeah. Yeah, that's right. I mean, it, it, it's actually a zinc rather than a, hmm. an iron-based um, thing. And so what we were doing, because a crab reaches equilibrium with its environment probably not too far dissimilar to, to what a, a turtle does, um, we were able to match or we were able to control the amount of oxygen in the environment mm. and then taking a blood sample and using a mass spectrophotometer, which took three hours to, to analyze one 
blood sample, we could measure the colour of the blood and match that to the amount of oxygen that we knew we were providing. Um, obviously today we take that for granted and we call that a pulse oximeter. But Interesting, uh, same, uh, same theory. Of course, they wouldn't work on members of the royal family, would they? No, no, they wouldn't, no. Um, and that's partly because what we were doing in effect was measuring the redness of the red stuff. Yes, rather than the blueness. Of the blue, of the stuff. blue stuff. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. And, and there, is, there is a theory I understand. Um, I think the gentleman's name is um, David Icke. I think he was a, 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 a famous footballer at one point. And he, he does... I, I believe he, so, yes. Yeah, yes. He, he, he does shows like, similar hmm. to this. And... Um, he, he has actually solved the conundrum associated with the royal family and the blueness of the blue stuff. Yeah. Because, yeah. as David Icke will tell you, the royal family are actually reptiles. They're, they're reptiles. Do, do you know, I, I, was, uh, I was trying to download something about that earlier, but unfortunately, I was using a 5G signal and someone burnt down the mast. So uh, I never yeah, got that's, to... That's the because end of, of coronavirus. Is that right? Yeah, of yeah, course. Yeah yeah, 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 yeah. Which, of course, is is perfectly appropriate for the, yeah. the times yeah. in which you're looking bemused here, Matt. <laughs> no, I'm fine. I'm just, I'm, I'm just. I feel like I'm soaking up the knowledge. Uh, no, no, you, you, yeah, that's, that's, it's because we've got gin. If, if, but, if we've got gin, we we have okay. gin. Um, Julian has Negroni. I think he's probably on his bad his second, and I'm I'm probably about my fifth gin by now. Uh, no, I've just I've, I've I've popped down to gin and tonic now because uh, the the grain is very very strong and, and very very dry. Yes, so I have something a little sweeter than dry. Exactly. I, I enjoy a Negroni. It's a good winter warming drink. I, I like that. It's really nice. No, I had a Negroni so when I was on holiday in uh, in Gozo a couple of years back. Uh, it was on their on their list. And I thought I haven't had a Negroni for years. I'm a Negroni, so I got this Negroni through, and it was in a glass about about high with a slice of pineapple and some umbrellas and plastic monkeys hanging from it. And I said, well, what's this? Oh, it's Negroni. I said, no, 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 this is orange juice with Campari martini and gin in it. It's not the same thing. Yes, well, you come and show us how to make one. And they invited me back. And um, I was there mixing this, this Negroni for, and they said, oh, that's very nice. And then someone came in and said, hey, while you're there, someone just asked for a Manhattan. Could you do one of those for us? I was there for about half an hour mixing cocktails for them. He said, oh, you, you, your starter's ready now. Do you, want to, do you want to pop back to your table? Were you wearing that shirt, Julian? Uh, probably. I wear this shirt everywhere. It's you, a vest, you wore, really. You wore that last week, didn't you? No, it was, it was my parrot shirt last week. This is, uh, this is fish. Oh, right. This is fish. <laughs> on. Moving on to willy probes, Mike. I, I, I thought you'd never... Sorry, I, I, I said that. No, I, I realised I said that and shifted on my seat. I didn't mean that I'm moving on to a willy probe. I don't want to give you the wrong impression. Viewers, look, that was just, you know, that was a mis-timed uh, uh, movement of myself, OK? So, uh, Mike, would you like to discuss um, willy probes? Willy probes? What, willy you probe. want You want me to bring that whole pulse oximeter thing? I think so. Forward. I think we need it, because this is... Uh, this is CPD. Matt, you probably realise that, obviously, it's a high-class CPD, and so we need to be discussing the science of all this. Okay. Well, yeah, okay, no problem at all. I'm going to share my screen with you then. They came through today, and seemingly the, the Willy probe is very popular with nurses, so I'm told. So there's there's a close closer up on the, of the screen there, so we can see we've got um, we've got an ECG recording, we've got a pulse oximeter, um, playing here, and mm -hmm. we've got a capnograph. We, we, we won't get into the capnograph waveform. It seems reasonably relaxed and reasonably normal. Yep. 49 on the, on the upper limit and for, for capnography and the, the respiration rate of 20. And that's where the pulse oximeter probe actually is. <sighs> but, uh, you know, there's people in Hamburg pay a good price for that. Well, <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. I mean, I'll stop sharing that screen because some people, some of our viewers, might find that rather <laughs> offensive. So, um, so that, that's it. That, that, the pulse oximeter probe is, is on the dog's prep use. 
the the it is well it's not technically it's, it's right across the the dog's willy but is it right um, across the willy yeah it is is it is in that regard but let me let me tell you a quick story about that because that has massive significance and and is good cpd that we can bring down into into simple basic steps hmm. the, the first recorded use of a pulse oximeter um was in the in veterinary medicine so the first recorded use of pulse oximetry in veterinary medicine was actually in the early 80s mm-hmm. and it came about whilst i was advising the british dental association on minimal monitoring standards and i was involved with a company that had invented this thing called or commercialized invented and commercialized this thing called a pulse oximeter we used to <laughs> anesthetize we used professional to anesthetize now. dental patients children in mm-hmm. the dental surgery for tooth extractions and, and complicated uh, procedures mm-hmm. with no monitoring at all and children yeah. used to die in the in the dental chair so the, the British Dental Association had done a study and they decided that they wanted to improve their anaesthesia. And as an industry spokesman, I was asked to go and sit on the advisory panel. Cutting a long, boring story short, from one of these meetings, a, a gentleman I was sitting next to, a very far-reaching dentist who ran a private practice, even... Well, those are quite far-reaching, aren't they? Because they've got to get right to... Right down. Yeah, right yeah. down. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Matt, you're looking really bemused by this. <laughs> you're fine. Uh, well, it's nice to be the only sober person in the room. It's fine. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, yeah, don't worry about it. We're going to get cut off in eight minutes, 38 seconds, so I'm going to have to hurry we up. We can do it. We can do this. We fine. can do this. Um, and he asked me if I would be prepared to let him use a pulse oximeter on his patient, on, on a special patient of his. And I went, yeah, no problem. So, move the clock forwards one week, mm-hmm. and the special patient was presented. And the problem with this patient was that they didn't have fingers, they didn't have toes, and the dentist concerned was working. Were they from Norwich? <laughs> no, no, they'd have had extra fingers and toes if they were from All Norwich. Right, right, okay, yeah. Yeah. He was working with a great big spotlight in the mouth. So I couldn't use the pulse oximeter probe on the tongue. Ah, okay. So, Arthur, the male lion at London Zoo, presented a bit of a problem for how to make a pulse oximeter work. Okay. And the segue there is that the only place I found I could fit this human finger sensor for a pulse oximeter was on Arthur's willy. So is the take home message there that lions have small willies or, or, or what? I, I'm missing the take home message there. The, the take- by, by, by the way, kudos for getting a probe on a lion's willy and still being alive to tell the story. Yeah, he was anesthetized at the time. And, 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 and I'm sure Matt can tell lots of other stories about where he's been able to put pulse oximeter probes far better than I. Um, the take home mm-hmm. message is if you want to use your pulse oximeter, find a well perfused capillary bed. Hold, hold on, hold on, Mike. I'm going to make some yeah. notes. Mike, right, make some notes, Julian. A well perfused capillary bed. Yeah. Because you're looking for a pulse to make the pulse oximeter work. Mm hmm. Okay. It's got to be accessible because you right. want to be able to put the pulse oximeter probe on somewhere. Matt, wake up, please. Stop looking down at your phone. Pay attention. Okay. He's on the high score of Crystal Maze or whatever it is. Well, he probably is. He's already playing Bubble Pop or something. I don't know what he's doing, but he's not paying attention. Right. So, Panda Pop. Actually, we'll, we'll test him on this. So, okay. well perfused capillary bed yeah. that's accessible. Mm-hmm. And if you can, minimal pigmentation. Because you'll find that if there's a lot of melanin in the skin or, or in the area that you're trying to work, 
the incredible intense melanin is there to absorb infrared light. And of course, the pulse oximeter is trying to shine infrared light through the tissues to measure the redness of the red stuff. So, so you're saying we've got well perfused capillary bed. Yeah. And minimum or minimal pigmentation. Yep. And, and accessible. If you've got those three things right, yep. then you'll, you'll get a good pulse should, oximetry reading. You should get a good pulse oximetry. So, so Matt, so what, are the, what are the three basics for a good pulse oximeter reading? I think there's four, but um, sorry Go to contradict you, but uh, I think, yeah, no pigment, somewhere you can get to, and decent amount of blood supply, definitely, and yeah. good contact is the other thing. Yeah, that's a, that's a good one. I'll, yeah. I'll, I'll give you that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that, that was pretty sciencey stuff, wasn't it? That was, that was very sciencey. Yeah. That was good CPD, I think. CPD. <laughs> have you, but it have doesn't you got a start with CPD just yet, does it? Sorry? Because it's not CPD unless you reflect on it. No, no, you need the certificate. I've got a certificate. But, but have we, we can't give the certificate unless people are reflected on it. Okay, we'd better reflect okay. on the CPD then. Are you ready? Matt, are you happy to reflect on the CPD? Um, I can't wait. Okay. That's enough. I reflected pretty quickly today. What? It's a super quick reflection. I was able to do it pretty much instantly. It's okay. We have today's certificate. There we go. Excellent. So CPD certificate for watching veterinary ramblings. Yep. Uh, this is to certify that the participant uh, was it, is recognised as Julian and Mike's little superstar for the year 2020. Yeah. And it signed. It signed me and him. Yep. So that's a that's a valid CPD certificate. So you can, you can all do a screenshot now and uh, and print that out. And um, did, you, did you get that, Matt? Great. Yeah. Marvelous. Uh, really? No, no, no. So let me see if we can get him. Let's phone him. So whether this will make the final cut or not, I don't know. But for those for those viewers that are uh, listening and not watching, uh, this is all part of the plan. We um, uh, intermittently cut the um, uh, the meeting and restart just to keep the interviewees on their toes it's uh, i think i think i think matt's blown us out <laughs> can we can we make a, a new mat out of things we have lying around the house that's, that's possible we... it's an odd thing it's an odd thing isn't it mm. that's less obvious how about if i i can move it over look there we go Puts me in a sort of shadow. It's the Mistron there. This is the voice of the Mistrons. I remember that. Captain Scarlet. Dun, 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 Aquamarine. No, that was that was um, Stingray. Was it Stingray? Stingray, Stingray. Da -da 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 -da. Oh, you wouldn't have heard that. I coughed. I put it on mute. Stingray, Aquamarine. I used to fancy her. I did. I did. She was lovely. She really was. I, I was growing up in my teenage years. I, I used to look for a woman who had that sort of. And I have to say, I, I went out with a few of them. And realized it's it's not living the dream after all. You know? No, no, it's not. The, the it's it's a good job you were doing that at that time because, of course, nowadays with this whole um, Instagram and personal selfie stuff, it's all. It isn't. Get a bit of trap out going. Yeah, I've I don't know. You, know, you, you, you think. You take huge amounts of care of your appearance, as do I. Well, I, I was in makeup earlier on tonight. Mm. And, um, was it Deidre to... doing it? No, not tonight. Not tonight. It was Karen. No. Okay. Um, oh, yeah, yeah. And, and she, she was putting the, the powder on because she 
mm -hmm. saying that she didn't yeah. want the, the spotlights to, to actually glint off, off the top of my head. It's worked very well. Yeah. It's nice. So I'm, try I'm trying to get Matt back here for two minutes. <laughs> Do you remember the old days of, of doing a lecture on um, on overhead projectors? And it would take about five hours to get a one hour lecture down. Yeah. And then with PowerPoint, it became sort of two or three hours to get a one hour lecture. And now with, um, with podcasts, it's um, 10 hours to get a 40 minute one out. Yeah. I think we've lost our guest. Has he gone? Yeah, which is a great shame because you were going to tell us a joke, weren't you? I was going to tell a joke. I was going to tell a joke relevant to Matt because I think he would have really liked this. Uh, we, mm -hmm. You introduced Matt as the um, as the frog king, I believe. Yeah. And so I was going to tell the, the, the joke about the wide mouth frog. And oh. I know, I'm sure you've heard it and everyone's heard it, but it, it always goes one more telling, doesn't it? Yeah. It's such a cheery little joke about this little wide mouth frog. I believe it was in Colombia, and he's walking through the jungle, and and he sees, and he's a monkey, and he says, "Hello, what are you?" And the monkey says, "Well, I'm a monkey." <gasps> really? Wow! What what do you eat? And the monkey says, "Well, I, I eat I eat nuts and fruit and leaves." <gasps> wow! Oh, wide mouth frog! I eat fly! Hmm. And off he goes, and he sees some. Um, he sees a tapir, and he says to the tapir, oh, "Wow! Who are you?" And the tapir says, "I'm a tapir. I eat grass and small shrubs and vegetation." <gasps> wow! Oh, wide mouth frog! I eat fly! And he goes along and he, he sees a parrot. He says, oh, Wow, what are you? And the parrot says, I'm a parrot. Oh, a parrot, what do you eat? And the parrot says, well, I eat nuts and seeds and fruit. Oh, wow, I'm a wild mouth frog. I eat fries. And he hops along and he sees a snake. He says, oh, What are you? And the snake says, I'm a snake. He says, a snake? What, what do you eat? And the snake says, I eat wide mouth frogs. And he says, you don't see many of those around here, do you? <laughs> but on that note, what a fabulous evening. Um, what a great evening. Good Always good to catch up with you. Thank you very much indeed, Matt. And I'm sorry you, you couldn't join us uh, for the Thanks, sign Matt. But Thank you, Matt Rendell. RBN, uh, super exotic nurse. Super, uh, super exotic frog man. Uh, absolutely. May your dog go with you. May your dog go with you too, Julian. Good night. Cheers. Thanks for joining us again tonight, and a massive thank you to Matt. I'm sorry, unfortunately, we were plagued by technical difficulties once oh. again this evening, and we actually ran out of time for a proper goodbye. Hopefully, we'll catch up again, and we can have him back for an episode in the future. Absolutely. Join us next week, though, when we'll be interviewing a very special guest. Georgie Hollis! Yeah!